Good morning. It's so great uh, to have you guys here. Um, in 2009, I was asked to join a group of leaders up in Manhattan. I was called together by uh, Chuck Colson, Robert George, and Timothy George to go over the initial draft of what would become known as the Manhattan Declaration. And we walked through the three issues uh, that they had outlined as being important issues that Christians needed to care about, life, marriage, and religious liberty. And uh, I admit clearly that I was sitting there going, I get life, I get marriage, but religious liberty, I mean, really, this is America. It's 2009, it's fine. And then two years later, I, I think, wow, Chuck was right. Uh, I also remember when Chuck started mentioning that from the administration, he was noticing a change in language from freedom of religion to freedom of worship. And I thought, ah, it's just a language game. I think you're overblowing this. And dang it, Chuck was right again. So uh, he was right on this issue on a number of, of levels, and it's very important to talk about this. This will be a theme for us at the Colson Center this year. It already has been. If you follow the videos that, that we put out, Jennifer, one of our panelists, and I have done several things on the HHS mandate, which we'll talk about. Uh, and we'll continue to talk about this, and we're also going to be hosting other events like this throughout uh, this year because it's, it's huge. Uh, there's a shift happening in what has been a uh, a long-standing understanding of what religious liberty should be and why it's so important uh, for, for the nation. Uh, Eric Metaxas was with us last night in the media leadership dinner. If you were there, we had all, all had a great time. He gave us a great exhortation about joy. But this is also a, uh, an issue that's huge on his heart as well. So I wanted to ask Eric. He's got to skedaddle right after this to the airport. And so he's not going to be a part of our panel, but he is going to uh, speak here at the beginning, and then we'll jump into the panel. Eric, thanks for being here. Yeah, sure, just use you. Right. Maybe, maybe I'll stand over here. Can everyone see me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Praise the Lord. Um, it's an honor to be here to talk on what is, um, I now realize, probably the issue of our time, if you have to boil everything down. And when people say something's the issue of our time, it sounds like hyperbole. It's not hyperbole if... Um, the issue is an umbrella issue. In other words, if you realize that it really is about this and not these other things that get us all excited, people say, well, the life issue is the issue of our time, or the same-sex marriage is the issue of our time. But what pulls them together for us now, and you need to write about this, you need to understand this and write about this, because we're not framing it this way in the culture, and we will lose unless we frame it this way. But religious liberty... Uh, is the issue where the rubber will meet the road for believers in America. Um, you're not going to put this on YouTube, right? Probably, it's okay. It's okay. Just don't put it on YouTube because my people will get to you and kill you. <laughs> and uh, in, in love, though, because they're Christian assassins. Uh, but they... It's just... so. No, that's okay. You can do that. That's fine. Um, but but I, um, <clears throat> I guess... <sighs> It's exactly what John said. In fact, John said a number of things that I, that I wanted to, to say, and I, I resent you. Uh, I, I actually generally resent you. But, but I have to tell you that it's exactly the same thing. In 2009, when I heard about the Manhattan Declaration, um, I mean, I was so off the radar. I wasn't even invited to that meeting, and the people who set it up are extremely dear friends of mine, and I live in Manhattan, right? <laughs> This is just not something that was on my radar. And I thought, well, it's nice that Chuck's talking about that. I guess it must be important because Chuck doesn't waste his time. But, eh. well, here's the, here's the issue. Um, sometimes God does stuff, okay? And, and the Lord called me to write the Bonhoeffer book. And the reason I say this, I'll spare you the details, but I, I had no master plan to write about something that would be relevant. I only wanted to write a book to kind of pay the rent and to get the story of this wonderful guy out there. And same thing with the, with the Wilberforce book. I didn't even want to write the Wilberforce book, but the Lord rather miraculously, again, I don't have time for the details, but maneuvered it so that I, okay, I decided to write a biography on William Wilberforce, which led to write a biography on Bonhoeffer. None of this is planned. And it was only while I was in the midst of writing the biography of Bonhoeffer, imagine, I went to this utterly ignorant, I'm just gonna go and see, see what we find. While I'm in the middle of the story, I start noticing these odd parallels, uh, which were a little disturbing. I thought, well, it's probably just me, because I'm a hothead, you know, and I'm prone to see parallels. Um, but the more uh, time passed, the more I thought, no, it's, it's not just uh, my perception. There are strange parallels. Now, if you take those parallels too far, 
then you are a hothead and you know, you're comparing the president to Hitler or something like that. And that's just so unnecessary and so stupid. Uh, but uh, it's good to have the specter of Hitler because it makes people take something seriously. It's not a little thing. It can lead to really bad places. So I see these parallels of a state, a secular state, that doesn't, of course, define itself as secular because who would be stupid enough to do that? Just pretend you're normal and average and uh, moderate and mainstream. But you're basically secular and in some key ways, and it's always in these key ways, these hot button topics, you're going to be not just different from the biblical, traditional 2,000 year old uh, worldview, um, but you're going to be diametrically uh, opposed to that worldview. So this is going to be the flashpoint. And so you see this happening in Germany now, of course, only Bonhoeffer really saw it. He, he could see way farther than anyone, and I, I won't get into why, but, but he's trying to wake up this year saying, you, you need to see where this is going, and we need to fight now. It's kind of like he could see that, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the white water was not just a patch in the river, but that it's going to get, there's going to be more white water, and there is a waterfall, and there's a, a point at which there's no way to get out. So if we paddle now together, we can get to shore. Uh, if we don't all paddle now together, Tomorrow, we will not be able, no matter what we do, to get to shore. We're going over the waterfall. When it comes to religious freedom, uh, that's what is happening now in America. And when Chuck spoke about this a couple of years ago, it, just, it, it meant nothing to me. But as I began to uh, write this book, I, I began to, to, to see these things. And then, of course, Chuck, when the book came out, f flipped out about the book and was all excited about it. And I was actually wondering why because I've written other books before, and he's never been particularly excited about them. And I'm not, I'm not bitter. Uh, but I realized that it was because somehow, and utterly unbeknownst to me, the story of Bonhoeffer focused all of these things that Chuck had been talking about in this heroic um, Christian figure. Uh, there was so much about Bonhoeffer that sort of focuses this, this kind of stuff. So suddenly I began to think a little bit about religious freedom, and then Chuck pulled me into a number of conferences that we did uh, together, and I began to see, my goodness, uh, Wilberforce to some extent and Bonhoeffer to a greater extent are all about this issue of religious liberty. Now, what is it about religious liberty? Here's what it is. We can talk all day long about why marriage should be between a man and a woman, and, and on and on and on. And I will tell you now that that argument is infinitely more difficult to put across to people, especially in America, because America has this tradition of tolerance, you know, live and let live, liberty, do what you want to do, whatever. It, and because, and this has been framed this way in the media recently, right, that America is it's always about expanding liberties, right? Th those are really despicable weasel words. Because the people who are saying that, they don't even know what liberty is. They're using it as a cliche, okay? Uh, it's kind of like there was the rush in the 19th century to communism and democratization toward, of course, toward some kind of communistic thing, whatever. That. There, there are people then talking about the inevitability of this, and, and this is about democratization and the freedom of man, and blah, 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 all this stuff, and stuff, because they were talking sloppily. They didn't really understand what is true liberty, right? Now, in America, we have tradition of true liberty, ordered liberty. Uh, Republican democracy, not mob rule, and we're supposed to think these things through, and we're supposed to protect minorities, right? It's not about everybody decides this, so we go in that direction. If everybody decides kill the Jews, I think our Constitution, our country would say, no, it doesn't matter that 90 people, 90% 90 of the people voted to kill the Jews, we're going to protect the Jews, we protect minorities. Um, enslave the blacks, there's more of us than they are, we all vote, let's do that. No, we can't do that because, I mean, we have it. That's the tradition of liberty in America to protect minorities. So today in America, we have this little minority, these crazy people who care about contraception, you know, those, those nutty Catholics. And we say, well, you know what? <clears throat> to paraphrase uh, or to, to, to quote Stalin, how many divisions does the Pope have? Now, some of you are old enough to get that reference. In other words, it's about power. We have the power. Pope, you can just shut up, you can stick it. We got the power, and we're going to make you do, we're, we're the big state, the big government, we're going to force you to do this. Well, you've got this hideous corollary today where the HHS mandate says the government has the power to force people to act against their religious conscience, to act against their conscience, and tough luck. Now, the moment 
that kind of religious liberty ends in America, America is, you've seen the beginning of the end of the United States of America. Now, if that sounds incendiary, unfortunately, it's because it is incendiary. People should get freaked out by this. People should understand that you're pulling a thread that's unraveling the whole fabric that we have had, which we've basically taken for granted for low these 200 years. We have so much religious liberty, we don't even know what it is. We don't talk about it. And until the last two years, I didn't even think about it. But this is a challenge. And just as Bonhoeffer said that we must fight now, and everybody says, why? What are you talking about? You know, he was trying to get them to see it. So I'm trying to get you to see it. A number of us are trying to get you to see it. Some of you see it. You need to write about this. The legal redefinition of marriage is the same thing. Forget about sexuality in the same way that you can forget about contraception. It's not about that. We can talk about that all day long. That's a separate subject. That's a separate subject. It doesn't matter what your neighbor thinks about homosexuality, about sexuality, about sex outside of marriage, about adultery, about contraception. We're not talking about that. That's a separate conversation. The point is, and you'll notice that no one is talking about this anywhere, the point is, if there's a legal redefinition of something called marriage, it will lead to a chilling effect on religious liberty in America. Now, nobody's talking about that. And you know why they're not talking about that? Some of them, it's because they don't know anything about that. And the others, it's because they know that if they start talking about that, it's not going to look good to redefine this legally. So we will just ignore that. But the fact of the matter is, if it's legally redefined. And again, you can love gays and you can be gay, you can be an agnostic, but if you love America, you understand that at the heart of who we are is this idea of religious liberty that protects minorities. And so those minorities in America who believe that sex is between a man and a woman, whether they're uh, you know, Muslims or Jews or Catholics or Protestants, whatever, or, or, or I've met you know, agnostics who feel this way, those people will less and less and less be able to vocalize that or to act on that. In other words, uh, what you, you may have heard in uh, 2008, the, the guy, he's a Christian man who headed up eHarmony. He was forced by the state of New Jersey to, you're, we're either going to run you out of business or you will set up a website to match um, gays. Now, he didn't want to do that. He felt compelled to do that. There, there are hundreds of these kinds of things popping up. This is barely the beginning. Uh, and we need to understand that uh, if we do not see this as a religious liberty issue, and if we don't push the other side and say, look, we'll give you whatever you want. Tell me that you will guarantee me legally the right to speak about a biblical definition of marriage. You give me every guarantee on that, totally, and then I don't have a problem. Then we can talk. Let's talk. Um, I would say the same thing with the HHS mandate. It's pretty clear that the other side isn't going to do that um, unless we force them to, unless we force them to talk about this issue. And again, I will say most Americans aren't even aware of this issue of religious liberty. I certainly wasn't. Our generation was never taught about this gift of ordered liberty and how religious liberty, we don't know anything about it. And we are a, a fragile experiment, uh, and if we as Americans don't know what this stuff is and don't protect it now, it will, it will be over. And in a couple of years, we'll have a panel talking about how if we had done this and this and this, we wouldn't be here now, but where we are now, there's, there's nothing we can do. So I do mean to frighten you uh, because I think this is, and I don't mean that should lead us to, to anxiety, but it should lead us to action, and we should understand that this is the signal issue of our day. I have seen it more and more and more clearly. If we don't start talking about that and push the other side to say, oh, unless you guarantee us religious freedom on these kinds of things, then, um, you know, w w there's no way we're, we're going to agree, but force them to do that, put them on the defensive, because they ought to be, because they're challenging something which has been at the very heart of the United States of America. Most Americans don't know that. We need to get it, and we need to tell people at that, because it will unravel all of our liberties, not for Christians, for everyone in America. Uh, to quote the words of Martin Niemöller, who said, you know, first they came for the socialist, I was not a socialist, first they came for that. This is that issue, right? First they came for the people who cared about contraception, I didn't really care about that. First they came for the people who I didn't really care about that. Well, they're going to come for something you care about, and it has no bearing on whether you're a Christian or anything. Liberty is fragile. 
uh, and this is the beginning of the unraveling of that, if we don't sound the clarion call now, uh, as Bonhoeffer tried to do in his day, I believe the Lord will give us a second chance that the German church didn't get it, did they? Um, so I think this is uh, it's a prophetic warning that the Lord is, is giving us through all these voices talking about this right now, and I'm glad that uh, you're here to, to care about that. I'm do very sorry I have to leave, but I've taken up as much oxygen as they'll allow me. Forgive me. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, John. Sure.